In another segment, I spoke to you about glide path management, but today I would like to expand that conversation to those instances where we do not have a glide path. Let's take a look. There are many times when we're working in the apical one-thirds of roots and we realize there are irregularities or impediments in the retreatment situation which would prevent us from having a smooth reproducible glide path. There are several factors that cause irregular glide path and let's take a look. The first one is anatomical. Clearly we can all imagine in our mind as you're listening to me talk along about the anatomy you can remember perfectly cases you've treated where in fact there was a sharp dilaceration like in this distal buccal root that was treated brilliantly by my friend Elio Baruti. But I think we all appreciate that trying to rotate an instrument around a 90 degree curvature is fraught with problems. If you just think logically of a speed of 300 RPMs as an example, and then you think about compressive and tensile stresses on the file in the curvature, it would be very likely that we would separate an instrument around that curve. So in deep uh, divisions, dilacerations, in these instances we have to have another idea other than mechanical shaping. Certainly in a bifurcation where an instrument has the opportunity to go two ways, the rotary file has shape memory. It's going to come down and hug the outer wall and it can be caught, its tip can be caught literally in a deep division or in a fin as an example off a primary system. Well there's other reasons for irregular glide path and that would be pathological. Certainly when we think about cases that exhibit internal resorption we can imagine looking at this preoperative film that there's not a lot of working width coronally as compared to the healthy contralateral tooth. If you Imagine picking up that more coronal remnant and sliding an instrument through it. That would take you into the resorptive defect that we can see at mid-root, but it would not be necessarily easily to insert the tip of that hand file into the more apical segment of the canal. In these instances, sometimes we might not initially have a glide path, but as we expand the shape manually, there might be a moment in time where we can resort to mechanical shaping. My good friend Lars Bergman, who has worked for many years at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, he was a student of Paul Lambrick. He gave me a slide, and you can see on the left, there's a yellow arrow and a more apical green arrow. If you look at the cross section through all three roots at the level of the yellow arrow, you can see that we have a MB1 with an attached stone inside the canal. Notice the MB2, the DB, and the palatal all are open patent canals. If you look at the higher section through the green arrow, you can see in this instance there is an attached stone associated with a distal buccal root. Obviously when you have attached stones, the instrument that you're using to catheterize the canal could hang up. And so we have to be very careful during glide path management procedures that we don't break these stones off and inadvertently drive them deeper into the canal to promote a serious block. The third reason we might not have a regular glide path is when we have iatrogenic events. Certainly when we're dealing with retreatment scenarios, it's normal to have blocked and ledge canals. And in these instances, even if we can get back into the physiologic canal and can negotiate through that apical one-third and establish working length and patency, it isn't necessarily true that we'd, we would be able to eliminate the large ledge, in which case we wouldn't expect to be using rotary or reciprocating instruments in these instances. So let's talk a little bit more about the instances when we have an irregular glide path and how will we know this as clinicians? Well, the assumption is you have already negotiated the canal. You have a 15 file at length. You have a confirmed working length with either a working film or using digital radiography. And you've established patency and confirmed that patent canals 
are, of the, are associated with canals that can be shaped. So you have a working length, you have an open patent canal, apically, and the question you want to know is, can I use mechanical instruments to shape this region of the canal? Here's how you will know, and after this little presentation, you should never ever be in doubt again when you should finish the apical one-third with manual instrumentation versus when is it safe and predictable to use mechanical shaping instruments. Here's the caveat. You must not reciprocate the handle of the file. We're simply going to pull the 15 file back about one stop. So the rubber stop, as an example, if it's one millimeter, you're going to pull the rubber stop back about one millimeter from the reference point and then see if you can slide the instrument back to the full working length. Let's see how this would work. So pull the instrument back about a stop and see if you can slide back to length. You must not reciprocate the handle to encourage a pre-curved file to slide back to length. That would be called cheating and you would not necessarily know if you had a glide path. So pull the file back two or three stops, then pull the file back four or five stops, and if that file trips up and will not slip and slide passively back to the full working length, then it would not be predictable to use mechanical instruments to shape this region of the canal. This is a very important lesson to learn about discovering when you can use mechanical instruments versus when you should use a snap-on handle. A snap-on handle can be converted, can convert, I should say, a rotary file to a manual instrument chair side immediately. In the ProTaper family of instruments, there are blister packs that have the various handles that match the color code on the handle of the mechanical shaft. And in this instance, we're getting ready to clip the purple handle on the purple banded file, the S1, Shaper 1. Once the handle has been clipped on, you now have a manual instrument, but it still is a straight instrument that has shape memory. So in this case, we use the orthodontic bird beak plier, and this plier can be used to curve the apical extent of the file. If we grab the file closer to the tip of the bird beak plier, we'll get a tighter radius. If we grab the file, as an example, more away from the tip, we're going to get a more gentle curve. So let's watch how we do this and understand we need to exaggerate to impart the curve we actually want. So we have to overcurve the instrument by rolling the tip of the instrument around that tapered metal beam to impart a smooth radius curve. The rubber stop can be torqued coronally so that its unidirectional stop is oriented with the curvature of the instrument. Let's take the examples that we've just talked about and apply them to this maxillary second premolar. Notice that this bicuspid tooth has a significant dilaceration in its apical one-third. I think we would all agree that it would be pretty easy to slide 10 and 15 files about two-thirds up the root and we could get a glide path going in the coronal two-thirds and that region could be shaped. But before we would start, like usual, we would get a diagnostic working length from a well-angulated preoperative film. You can see if we stay out of that curvature, we can focus all of our attention to the upper two-thirds. By pre-enlarging the upper two-thirds of the canal initially, we can now pre-curve this file, and this small-sized, flexible pre-curve file can be easily introduced through the pre-enlarged canal, and the instrument will arrive in the curvature pre-curved. This is one of the major lessons to help us negotiate and navigate and catheterize and secure highly curved canals. Once we have a reproducible glide path in the apical one-third, in this instance manual shaping procedures were indicated so that we don't risk breaking an instrument. Gutta percha cones slide quite easily around pathways of curvature if the outer wall is smooth and devoid of ledges or little bumps or wee waws that could trip up the cone and have it roll over. Once this cone has been fit, we can mix sealer 
and then we can use the warm gutta percha technique to carry a wave of warm rubber up into the apical one-third and cork that root canal system. In this mandibular bicuspid tooth, again we're talking about glide path, you would anticipate that we would not have a smooth reproducible glide path in the apical one-third. That's because a single canal through the coronal two-thirds of the root bifurcates deep into two or more separate apical portals of exit. Notice the files are terminating and are centered with the lesions of endodontic origin. We fit a pre-fit cone and this non-standardized cone can be fit into one of the branches. Usually there is a branch that is more available to our instruments and that means the instruments usually take the path of least resistance. This becomes the focal uh, point of shaping and this is where you'll fit your master cone. We can now carry a wave of warm rubber down through the length of that cone and soften that apical one-third of that cone and through waves of condensation build up enormous sealer hydraulics so we can fill root canal systems. When we look at the post-treatment image of these two mandibular bicuspids, it's pretty exciting. Notice the diversity and the manifestation of complex root canal system anatomy. Of course, when we look at these films, it's easy to get caught up with the thrill of the fill, but what I really want you to be thinking about is not the obturation that led to this visual result. I'd like you to think about the importance of having a glide path. By having a reproducible glide path, we then can shape that region of the canal, and it's the shaping that allows us to have a sufficient reservoir of sodium hypochlorite. And through, uh, through hydraulics and through dynamic irrigation, we can begin to move these reagents off the main system and out into the lateral branches. And if we cleanse things out of the root canal system and then use a three-dimensional obturation technique like warm gutta percha, we can generate waves of condensation. Waves of condensation generate enormous sealer hydraulics and we can pack materials and move obturation materials into the anatomy that is present. Notice the myriad of lateral canals on the second bicuspid. There might be as many as seven or eight portals of exit. And of course, on the first bicuspid, you have a deep bifidity and a third more coronal portal of exit. Notice how the lesions are centered more or less around the apical portals of exit. Let's look at one more case where glide path management made an enormous difference. This is the maxillary first molar. Notice how this bridge is double abutted posteriorly, but the sinus track is being traced by a gutta percha point and it traces to a lesion of endodontic origin associated with the buccal roots and you can see a diffuse halo endodontic infection associated with the palatal root. Careful access through the porcelain and through the understructure metal gets us to the pulp chamber and once we're in that pulp chamber all the things we've been talking about become important. Notice that we've catheterized the distal buckle and the MB1. The point uh, of showing this particular case is Cliff Ruddle does not know how to curve the apical extent of the tin file in the MB1. I have no idea. The secrets to success were to do pre-enlargement procedures. Once I have a pre-enlarged canal, I can put a little generic curve on the tin file as an example, and then I can watch wind that instrument through the coronal two-thirds, but when I arrive apically, I'm not really reciprocating the handle much anymore. It's kind of a gentle picking motion. And once I get a little stick, which means the end of the file is engaging the anatomical pathway, I begin to slide the instrument and sneak it to length. So I'm not reciprocating the handle, I'm sliding over the last few millimeters. And I'm keeping inside the canal, I'm working the tin file in short one millimeter amplitude strokes until that instrument is completely loose. And the same would go for the MB2. Once you get around a curve, the tendency is to pull out the instrument and move on through a sequence of instruments. Do not pull any instrument out that is navigating or negotiating sharp, abrupt curvatures until the instrument is sloppy loose. And to completely make my point, again, I don't know how to curve this instrument in the MB3. 
Notice the furcal side concavity of the MB root, but in a picking motion and sliding, I can get to length. Once I am at the apical terminus, I will move this instrument in and out in short amplitude one millimeter strokes, maybe as many as 10, 20, 40, 50 times, but until the instrument is sloppy loose, this gives me a chance to move to the next instrument. Because once this instrument is loose, I have made significantly more space than the geometries on this particular file would suggest by just working it deliberately and repeatedly until the instrument has become free. When we look at the post-operative film, you can see that we have fulfilled the tenets of glide path management. And to ask ourselves and measure our results so we don't just hope we're getting better, but we can measure our results so we can actually get better, we need to ask ourselves the following four questions. If you look at any given canal, ask yourself, do I have a continuous tapering preparation coronal to apical? Two, have I maintained the original pathway? Three, have I maintained the position of the foramen? Did I lose the foramen, block the foramen, or relocate the foramen on the external root surface? And finally, number four, did we keep the foramen as small as practical? It would be unnecessary and unwise, and it would be absolutely dangerous to think of carrying large size instruments around abrupt curvatures in the apical one-third of that MB root. So we've had a little discussion today on those instances where there is not a regular glide path. We focused on the irregular glide path, and I trust you've gotten sufficient information that you can approach these cases with more confidence. There's an old expression, when you remove doubt, confidence shows up.